Hi everyone, you're watching another edition of the AIO Hardware Show 2023 After Show. This is our post main show freeform style podcast where we talk about the chips we've gone through in the main episode, but it's a more personable approach rather than just facts, figures, and numbers. I'm your host, Ian Cutris, and joining me as always, that's Ward Foxman from eTimes. Hello. And this episode, we've got a bit of a mix of of parts. I, I don't think you can classify them <laughs> in any way. It's just here's because we're, we're getting slowly to the end of the series, and the last episode is a special one. Yeah, we're now these are still a bit of a mixed bag, though. Mixed bag, a mixed yeah. bag. So, first up is a company we've spoken about before. Yep. Tens Torrent, or now affectionately known as the Jim Keller Company. Well, yes. Though, though the. Uh, the guy that we speak to at Tense Torrent really hates it being called that because there are more people at Tense Torrent than just Jim Keller. Uh, but the chip we covered in the show, episode 11, I think this will come out at, is Grayskull, which I said on the show is their first chip. Technically, it's their second. Do they have a test chip or they something? They had a test chip. Okay. They were one of these companies, and you sometimes see it with the startups in this space. They do like a small... 20, 30, 40 square millimeter test chip just to make yeah. sure that they can tape out and everything works before they actually do a productizable version yeah. of that. And Grayskull being the first generation of that chip, it's it's one of these massive 700 square millimeter monsters, 12 nanometer. You get it on a PCIe card, which is really important. Really? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I was in the offices literally a few weeks ago. That's why the Jim Keller interview, you know, as we're filming this, the Jim Keller interview went out last week or the week before. I mm -hmm. uh, got to see Jim, got to see the cards. I think you can either get one or two on a PCIe card. Two on a PCIe card? Yeah. And how much power? Uh, so the full PCIe card can go up to 300. And so, two chip, two 700 square mil chips and only 300? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, well, you play around voltage for yeah, yeah, or whatever, okay. yeah. So, okay. but uh, the 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 point of this chip is essentially this is what our architecture looks like, and yeah. uh, we said on the show, it's these what are called ten six cores, so yep. like tensor but ten six. Why is it called ten six? <laughs> well, rather than tens five, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Ten six, uh, and inside each ten six core is five baby risk processors. Yep and like a compute engine and some memory. Those baby risk processors do the control and manage the compute and network. It's a custom uh, high bandwidth on-chip network. And there are, then, there are, then there's a, like a thread scheduler based on arc cores, and then it's uh, LPDDR, I think, with this, yep. with this first generation. And the, usually when, companies usually get the first chip out before the software is ready. Okay, yep. Because I know you're going to go visit them soon, and they'll speak a lot about their software stack and how it's kind of only just getting ready even though they're on the second chip. So yeah, uh, software is hard. Software is hard. Software and, is hard. Everyone says they've got a software stack, and everybody says it works, and everybody says they've got all the features up and running, but not that many, it turns out, still actually have. So I, mean, I remember companies three, four years ago were talking about their software stack, and it's still not ready today, ready in the sense of... Well, yeah. It's... Uh, <laughs> Machine learning's somewhat unique in the fact that, is it unique? There's the, you can sort of do most of the mainstream operations, but then it's the edge case stuff that you need to support, whether it's you know, in PyTorch, Onyx, and... But then something completely new comes along, like Transformers, and yes. just totally takes over, yeah. and then you need to be able yeah. to make support for that as well. So, yeah, the everything changes very quickly, and it's difficult for software to keep up, or it yeah. can be difficult for software to keep up. So th this grace scale design with the 10 six cores, um, Jim speaks about the optimum size of a matrix engine for mm. compute. Because machine learning is training and inference, and we've spoken you know, on this show even about companies that focus purely on training, purely on inference, and you can have optimized sizes of compute for both. What Jim is saying, and Lubija Bajic, who is one of the co-founders, now CTO, is that there's an optimum size for that level of compute at about four tera ops. Okay. Before you essentially have to communicate with other. I see. Uh, other cores in that sense. So their chip has 315 tera ops. 
Uh, again, with these art cores and LPDDR, and then the second generation added Ethernet for training. Yep. So the first one was more inference, second one is more for training. And then future generations, which we'll get onto in the next episode, uh, you know, extends that idea of both compute and networking. But, you know, it, I think it comes back to Jim's core philosophy. You know, one chip looks like, uh, one core looks like one chip, yes. looks like one system. Yes. So if yep. you need to scale, the code looks the same no matter what. Yeah. And we're seeing other companies do that, like Tesla with a dojo. Yes. You know, their their yep. thing is also one one core looks like one chip, looks like one system, you know, and a few others. Um, <clears throat> I was going to say Cerebrus, but their one chip is a system. Yeah. <laughs> so it, and the, the point is to try and not have so many layers of complexity on top of that before you have to go talk to a core in another chip. And that may be and one of the limiting factors. Mess about with GPUs. partitioning yeah. and stuff and parallelism, yeah. model parallelism and all the rest of it where yeah, if it if it just looks like one big thing then yeah, good to go. And if you can get the latency the same on chip and off chip, yep. that's a difficult problem. Yep. I know Grok thinks they've figured it out <laughs> um with their mesosynchronous array and what whatever. So but that's an inference chip. So it's a it's, different yeah. yeah, different sort of thing. But Tense Torrent their roadmap runs to four generations right now, and the fourth is constantly in flux every time I see a new yeah. version. Uh, they're currently on their second, they're prepping for their third, and in the episode we spoke about the first. And I, I, I did ask Jim, do you have customers that you're ready to talk about? He said, we have customers. <laughs> but he, do, he wants to do something more than just have a photo of the customers holding a chip. Yeah, absolutely. Which is what a lot of companies do. Yeah. But a lot yeah. of companies do that in order to essentially do a new cycle. Absolutely, yeah. And you know, I th you you said when you last spoke to Tens Torrent, uh, our contact said he doesn't need to do new cycles because Jim sells it on his own. It's exact words where he could sell a story about Jim Keller eating a burger, which I think yep. is probably true. Yeah. Um, but yeah, maybe not quite the way to go. So, but Tens Torrent is a startup, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of venture capital funding. They say they're being very frugal with their money. Uh, pivot from that into hyperscaler silicon because every time I speak with Wall Street, they ask, what are the hyperscalers doing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're working on it is the answer. They're still working on it. Um, still making new chips, or some of them are. Um, AWS uh, is certainly making new chips. So they acquired this uh, company called Annapurna Labs in Israel in 2015, mm -hmm. and since then they've put them to to work doing the Graviton and all the others. Um, but for AI specifically, um, they have the they had a first gen called Inferentia for inference, and now they have a second gen which has a training chip and an inference chip. The inference chip is called Inferentia Two, imaginatively titled, yep. and the training chip is called Trainium. Um, so what's interesting? So there's several interesting things about this. One is. For Inferentia 2 and for Tranium, they're both based on the same second gen core, or at least right. it seems that way. Unless someone make a, made a copy paste error on the website, <laughs> it seems like the oh. same core, same gen core, same size, yep. two cores on each chip, the same, yep. same precision modes on both, same, same amount of memory, same, 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 almost everything. So the, I think the Tranium was 210 tops and the Inferentia 2 was 190 tops, but that's the only thing. 10% different. Yeah, it's, 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 quite, it's quite a small difference. So I'm scratching my head here. If you know the answer, is this the same silicon? If you know the answer, please leave me a comment and tell me because I couldn't figure out what the difference is between the two. They presented this at AWS reInvent. That's right. Um, and there was lots of interesting details um, about the core and kind of how it works um, and these stochastic rounding which is yeah, kind of oh, explained yeah. in the talk, um, which is yeah. very cool and very, and I haven't heard that anywhere else either. I don't know if anybody else is doing that in hardware. So that, that was that was kind of interesting. So stochastic rounding, for those who don't know, is essentially being able to convert between different data types. It's it's kind of like if you, so the way they explain it in the, the way he explains it in the reInvent keynote or the reInvent talk is if you, like if you add two numbers together and one of the numbers is really small, the, the effect of that gets lost in the rounding. Yep. Um, but with stochastic rounding, sometimes it's probabilistic. Sometimes it rounds up, sometimes it rounds down. 
Right. So if you're adding small numbers together, you can sort of yeah. get higher accuracy um, by the end. So it's about right. accuracy, but it's about accuracy of calculation. And the overall effect is your training will actually converge faster. Uh, so this is this is similar to a problem such as like reduction, where you're adding lots of things together. If you're adding, say, one, say a millionth, 0 0.00001 to a number like 3 million, you, and you're only dealing with, say, 16-bit floating point or even 32-bit floating point, that's not going to have an effect. And even if you had a million of them, if you had a million of them one by one by but one If you by round one, off after every step, you'll yeah. always just stay at the same place. And you will. Uh, modern computers do round off at every step because you're dealing with a specific data type. Yes. And the data type has a limitation yes. on the accuracy. In reduction, you essentially add the smallest numbers together eventually, and then it, and instead of it becoming a long series of additions, you get a pyramid of additions, all converging on a singular value. Um, and so I can see this in machine learning. Essentially, you take your high number and your low number. If you convert the high number into a format the low number recognizes, yeah. and then you keep it in that format until the end of the pipeline, convert it back into the original. I think we've, we've already covered a chip in this in this series where they have multiple different internal floating point types. Yes, yes. Yeah. FP19, FP24, yeah. even though the chip itself was built for int 8 and int 6, yeah. int 16, sorry. And the whole point of FP19 and FP24 was to maintain the accuracy through the calculation. It's often why when we see um, matrix modifications, uh, especially for, say, inference, companies talk about int 8 for the inputs and FP32 for the output. Yeah. Because in order to keep the accuracy from the inputs and the operations, because the operations create complexity, create more more you know numbers that require additional um, additional digits in them, then you need that 32 point floating point 32 accumulator at the end. So yeah, being able to recognize that mid layer for example during a machine learning layer yeah. is difficult yeah and if it uh, yeah i think the converging faster bit they're talking about is simply it means that our code recognizes this data because if you're not recognizing it then you would converge slower the other argument is well if it's so small then does it even matter does it matter yeah no 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 so just for context they're talking about like 20 to 30 percent faster which is absolutely enormous so yeah, I, I guess, it, yeah, if you're adding something that's a million times smaller, a million times every tenth of a second. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Then it obviously adds up. Yeah, I don't know. It's... Um, but yeah, it was, I thought it was an interesting approach because I hadn't really hadn't mm. really heard that in many places. I hadn't heard, of, hadn't heard anything about stochastic rounding in other and chips, so I thought it was very cool. It's dedicated hardware for it as well. Dedicated hardware for stochastic so, rounding, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I can see if, if, if any chip ever pivots to, say, posits, which are different to floating points, different bits for different things, um, yeah, that could become very important. So, yeah, so let's move on to the more French side of this. No, to no, France. To France. Um, and the, the next company in this episode is a company called Calray. Now, I've seen Calray mentioned in, you know, in general related to AI for years. So they've been around for years they've and been years. Around. It's, um, they spun out or they're derived from the French Energy Commission or equivalent. And th but the thing is, I never got a grasp necessarily, a specific grasp on what their solution is because it's a small startup like business or they have, you know, very, fairly small customers and it's not promoted in the same way. But their processor, their AI accelerator, isn't necessarily an AI accelerator in, in the sense that we've been talking about all these episodes. It's an MPPA, Massively Parallel Processor Array, okay. which sounds like a many core chip. Yeah. Or the things that supercomputers used to be based, you know, it's, it's rather than having a core with a bunch of accelerators, it's like lots and lots of cores. I mean, we, we're spoken about a few chips in this series with a thousand cores, yes, right? Yeah. Whether that's yeah. uh, some, you know, something big like Esperanto that's coming up, or 
untethered, there are yep. lots of cores. Yep. Uh, or, you know, Cerebrus, 800,000 cores, whatever. It's a lot of cores. But the whole point of the MPPA, um, I think this is the MPPA 3 80, codename Coolidge, because Coolidge is a word, apparently. In French, maybe it is. I don't know. Um, but the idea is that this chip can do more than just artificial intelligence. It's more of a general purpose chip. Accelerator, sort of. GP, it, general purpose accelerator chip, GPAC. I don't know. <laughs> but we've got GP, GPU, we've got GP, NPU. And, yeah. So, or, I mean, this or, is for accelerating stuff that was happening before AI, right? This is how long well, CalRay has been around, I feel It like. was, but this latest generation has more of that AI acceleration inside it. Okay, right. Um, so, it... And they were also one of these companies that practically say their chip could be used for anything, right? Yeah, okay. But what, where we've seen the most focus for CalRay in is storage. Yeah. Hel helping accelerate storage arrays. Now, big companies obviously have large data sets. They need to keep them encrypted or they need to you know, do monitoring for fraud as data comes in. And so you need to have a general purpose processor that can do all sorts of different operations on your data. So that, that, that could be something as simple as compression. Yes. Right? Uh, and, and and on top of that, and, uh, again, CalRay says we could be used in automotive because we can also do video, but video also in storage could be a thing as well. So Yeah. And, um, but I mean, We're always a bit skeptical when people say automotive. It's yeah. got to be an auto designed for automotive from the ground up, I think, yeah. uh, is my personal belief. Automotive has so many added standards that you need to be able to support. So many different requirements that are absolutely unique, the qualifications and certifications you've got to have, and you really got to understand the market inside out. And you have to not be a startup because it takes 10 years to design yeah. in, and there are so many other requirements. I'm like, why Why is anybody yeah. going for automotive that isn't yeah. NVIDIA? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll get to a chip later in this, which actually is an automotive focus. Yes. <laughs> Stay tuned. Yeah. Sorry. And now for a company that has a product whose name you don't want to say in front of a mirror three times. <laughs> it's FlexLogix Infrax X1. It's perfectly pronounceable. That's FlexLogix Infrax X1. FlexLogix Infrax X1. Yeah, with, with, the, with an X. For some reason, this company loves Xs. I mean, so. that's okay. The name of the first product was EFPGA. Like, and the, so the for the EFPGA is like... Yeah, so... so, so there's the, no X in that, so they thought... This is a company that's also been around a while. I remember seeing that's right. um, their banners at Hot Chips showing the EFPGA products. And, yeah. and, and I, I saw them actually last year. at uh, It was either a design automation conference or Semicon West at you know, sh showcasing their AI hardware, which is now dead. Well, <laughs> uh, so they, they've pivoted to uh, provide IP based on the AI design that they have got. So so the chip, maybe not so much, but the IP there is still there. It's, uh, I mean, we've, we've said this on a previous episode. Now that we're 11 episodes in, we've kind of re rehashing the same thing, but I appreciate some people may not have seen the other episodes. When it comes to IP only companies, the big one is ARM. Yep. But from our perspective, we like to see companies design chips because it means we can you know, the tape out work is done, they've done some extra validation, and then we can actually look at the performance. Yeah, it's like proof, um, yeah. especially for a startup, it's like proof that it actually, to see it in silicon, it's yeah. like to see a hard copy of something, like, like it actually <laughs> works. Copy. Yeah, the, the, you know, the yeah. original birth certificate. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And the, the, fact that they, the fact that they have chips already, had chips already, is mm. at least on that way, but it does mean IP companies are competing with lots of other IP companies and they're going to ultimately end up with a few customers who may want it, but then how much of a market is there really for that? Well, it depends who you believe. If you believe AI is going to be an absolutely single device, every single system everywhere, all over the edge, <laughs> then maybe there is room for lots of different IP players, but... There's going to be consolidation and... There's going to have to be some con consolidation, um, and there's going to have to be, I don't know, if you, how do you choose between them is my... Yeah. Without these performance figures that we're talking about, mm -hmm. power consumption and so on, which is you know, related to what the customer chooses to do with it. At least if you're only doing IP, you can be more reactive to the content of the day. The True. You can, you can, absolutely, you can move quicker. 
Um, but you also have to be able to evolve your, evolve your software. You still have to have software with it, of yeah. course. You have to be able to evolve yeah. your software stack at the same speed. I mean, so the InfraX X1, yes, because there are multiple Xs in there. Yep. Uh, their whole thing is, you know, 64 cores of 1D tensor arrays. I mean, this is this went out in 2020. This yeah. came out in 2020. So three years on, maybe things look a little different. But I think the, the principles are sound with the reconfigurable interconnects and so on. Yeah. And the memory structure that they've got. I don't know. I thought it was a promising design. And I think it's a good company. So, yeah, I, I'm interested to see who buys their IP and what they do with it. I mean, yeah, that, that whole reconfigurable I.O., the fact that they're you know, an FPGA company at heart mm. means that they want to pepper their design with configurable logic. And this isn't you know logic that just can support a variety of instructions. This is actually, let's reconfigure our tensor arrays to pipeline for best optimal throughput given the bandwidth considerations. Do it. FPGAs are used in a lot of places because the workload can change and you need something more optimal than a CPU but may not be as power efficient as an ASIC. But an ASIC can do one thing, whereas an FPGA could arguably can do, do anything. anything. Yeah. So what they're doing here is essentially kind of like Xilinx is doing. It's a mixture of configurable logic and support with hardened accelerators, except in this case, it's more the network that's configurable and yes. the accelerators are all fixed. Kind of, yes. Yeah. yeah, I think so. They have some other fun things like, you know, being able to store the activations in the compute array uh, so that if you don't need to, if you've already loaded the next layer, you can kind of, you don't have to go out to memory and stuff like, I don't know, I think there's a lot of features of the design that I really appreciated, yeah. but yeah, I'm sad to, I'm sad if the chip no longer exists. That's, that's sad. It's always sad. <laughs> <laughs> when this happens. Well, okay, because they're no longer uh, doing chips themselves and they're an IP company, maybe they still have some chips. Yeah, uh, they that certainly they no, had no all need. different kinds of systems, PCIe cards and so on, all different kinds of form factors for all. It's for edge. Um, yeah. It's for edge compute, this. So, so story time, like I say, I, I met with them at DAX Semicon West and they had two products on display and I'll show pictures of them because I took photos. They had an M.2 module so standard M.2 form factor and a PCIe card. Uh, but my, uh, I said to the guy there, and I don't think he got my point, right? I said, you don't need a separate full length PCIe card if you've got the same product. All you need to do is have a PCIe card with an M.2 slot on it. Maybe two, maybe four, because you can get those now. And you just put the M.2 card into the PCIe with an M.2 slot. And that way, you only need to keep one product in your warehouse, and then you can add it onto the PCA card or multiple PCA cards as needed. Because it was a PCA by 16 connection, and then lot two is by four max. Okay. So you could have put four on the card, and or depending on the switches and stuff. And he didn't. I tried to explain this to him, and he didn't get it. I'm not. Sh <laughs> I, th I think. Were you having a rant at this I was point? Were you ranting rant. at this point? I, I was. I, I, I think the guy was more of a. More of an engineer and not pro product focused. Oh, I see. Okay. It's like, uh, as in, he didn't he didn't necessarily have to think about uh, the production supply chain in that way. And to to any company that's making a chip with an M.2 form factor module, and that's the own, quote unquote only thing you're doing, there's no need to do a full blown PCIe card like that. As well. As well. Yeah. You can just have lots of M.2s, and because that standard is ubiquitous, they go anywhere now. So you need it in a Nook or you need it in a, a automotive or something, you slot it in. You don't need a massive PCIe card. Yeah. So, and then and then speaking of uh, AI engines and everything else, it's, it's the whole the whole series is about AI. Um, AMD at CES this year, so twenty three, announced that they were putting their AI engines inside their laptop CPUs. Now, AMD acquired Xilinx, and it, that finished last year, you know, some $45 billion, $46 billion, I think, one of the largest acquisitions. Altera was acquired by Intel back in 2015, 2016, sorry, for only $15 billion by comparison. And since even Intel's acquisition, we've been waiting for FPGA-style stuff to come into CPUs. Yes. Intel tried a little bit. But, it, uh, but that was more of a enterprise CPU plus FPGA separate sockets. 
Now, Intel, uh, AMD acquires Xilinx, and within a year, we already have Xilinx AI engines coming into laptop CPUs, even quicker than FPGA did, because FPGA still isn't there. Intel is is also planning to trial their AI engines, the VPU, the Keembay that we spoke yeah, about yeah. last episode, in future mobile processors. So AMD's beaten, beating Intel to the punch here. However, there's a big but in all of this, and it's perhaps the reason why AMD didn't hype it up as much as they could have. These chips, the 7040 series mobile chips, have these onboard AI engines. We don't know the architecture. However, they will only be on select models, only be available from certain OEMs, only in certain product lines, hmm. and very likely only available to certain people to buy them. Interesting. Right. They're so, testing the water a little bit. It's We don't know. Uh, I, I think I, I need to speak to a couple of guys there and whether they'll say it on the record or not. I think here they have a very specific customer who has requested this. This happens all the time in this sort of industry. You have a customer who has a very specific use case and they want accelerators for it. And as long as they pony up the money in yeah, advance, yeah. a company may modify their product to offer this very unique feature. And that company who ordered it essentially is the only one who gets to buy it. Yeah. And we see this in uh, you know big CPUs. We hi we've highly suspect suspected for a while that say in Xeons and Epics, there are special features that might be for like hyperscalers that only hyperscalers can have access to, and those features are disabled for everybody else. Whether they're spoken about externally or not, as well, is a different thing. So with AMD here, it's either that they have a specific customer, or as you say, they're testing. It's a trial run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the problem they have here is the same problem AVX five twelve had in mobile. You can put it in, but if nobody develops software for it, yeah, if nobody uses it, then then it's um, silicon die area that's lost, and usually mobile processors, you know, power performance area cost. Yeah, it's the area and cost that matter as much as power performance. Desktop, you can get away with that a little bit. Yes. In mobile, you can't. Okay. So you you either use it or it gets lost. And we haven't heard much from AMD about software, about SDK support, what even the AI engines look like, whether it's a derivative of Xilinx's technology. They're calling it XDNA, so I assume. X. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, so, so now they have XDNA, RDNA, CDNA. Okay. And I, I kept wanting to say CNDA because that's corporate NDA. <laughs> um, so what exactly these would be used for? I mean, in a laptop, it comes down to what AI cases are there in a laptop? So I think there's a few. Um, I think depending on how big the engine is, um, if it's a, just a small one, it can be, you know, you look at the laptop, are you looking at it with your eyes? And if you're not, then it locks the screen mm -hmm. or it powers down. If you've walked away, it powers down or mm. it's somebody looking over your shoulder, you know, or that kind of thing. These very kind of, but it all kind of, it helps save battery. It basically, the ultimate aim is to save power, mm. to save battery. So anytime you can switch the screen off and if you do that more intelligently and more dynamically, then you can save power, which is a great selling point. That only really works is if it recognizes when you're in front of it as well. <laughs> and in yeah. order to do that, it means it has to be on its own low voltage power island. And I know some companies are trying to do that with like little FPGAs. Yep. Because I know Lattice has a solution That's for right. that. That's right. Yep. Intel's trying to do that using their onboard sensor engine. And you know, smartphones can do something similar some of the time. So that yeah, that makes sense. It could even be for something as small as say wake words. Yes, uh, like voice activation. Yeah, yeah. If he wants to speak to the laptop or yell at the laptop, maybe <laughs> in my case. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, voice assistants haven't really gained traction on laptops. Cortana was way too early. Yeah, I'd, I, and in some ways, I think maybe it would be useful, but in some ways, I'm not so sure. Yeah, I mean, it it, it comes back to the software development environment. In order to have these applications ready, there needs to be a robust software development ecosystem. AMD needs to be reaching out to the software development community, supplying its software development kit, and putting it in the hands, letting people emulate it, and then running on hardware. 
that only works when the soft when the hardware itself is ubiquitous. Yeah. Because this hardware is in, only on very small specific parts, that's why I think it's for what you know one or two specific customers only, and not for me, not for you. Yet. No. Okay. Yet. Okay. Or they're putting it in the hands of very specific developers who can develop some of this stuff. But yeah. again, yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll see what happens. Um, maybe if it works out, we'll start to see more. Mm. Um, I, I think so. As transistor budgets go up, as process nodes yeah. shrink, you got to use those transistors for something. Yeah. So accelerators is usually a good good it's shot. It's a good shout. Yeah. And that's one of the chips that's not being used for automotive. <laughs> one of the only ones that hasn't one said <laughs> that they want to do automotive. automotive. Um, moving we, on to an actual automotive yeah. chip. Um, so Amberella. Uh, so so Amberella. So this is this is about moving processing, like perception processing from the inner car, autonomous yeah. car, or a car with some autonomous features. Maybe you've got radar and you have several radar sensors kind of around the car. Um, but you had to do edge processing, basically have the processing, the AI processor right in the radar sensor, yep. because the radar produces so much data that you couldn't physically get it to a central controller. Yep. But Umbrella basically have acquired this company called Oculi, and they have these super cool radar algorithms that works on an ordinary radar sensor. And ultimately, what to cut a long story short, it it vastly reduces the amount of data data that you get Data. Data. <laughs> it, it vastly reduces the amount of data um, that you need to send from the radar sensor for processing. Right. So it means you can process it in a central processor with the S special AIs that they've got. Because super cool. Um, there was a there was a company a, a few years ago that got acquired by Marvell called Aquantia, and their whole thing was Ethernet in the car, and they were able to do. Um, two and a half gigabit Ethernet over a single twisted pair. Mm -hmm. I think maybe even they tried to do 10 gigabit over a single twisted pair. But the idea is you only have so many wires you can run through the car from a sensor to a control board. Yes, yeah. And not only that, but when the data gets to a control chip, the control chip needs to be able to be powerful enough to process all the data at once. So if, if you have multiple cameras, LiDAR, it's a radar, lot. You need to manage the data flowing through the car, yeah. but also you need this sort of sensor fusion hub yes. to be able to do it. Exactly. Um, but then the benefits of doing the fusion kind of all in one place is you can do stuff like you can be more aware of things like if you're driving down the highway really mm. fast, you can switch off the radar at the back and just, just focus on the radar at the front. Or if you're doing parking, then switch them all on. Or, you know, you can do things like... Under certain weather conditions, maybe focus more on your camera rather than radar or vice versa. Right. Um, you can change the way you do sensor fusion depending on the conditions, um, which I think is cool. Um, you can also kind of have a bigger meaty kind of chip in there and basically try and extract more more meaning from it and make the, the AI more robust. It's, um, you know, to quote Musk, um, he, he, he did say, or has said in the past with self-driving, now whether you agree in Tesla's approach or not, um, humans are slow. Yes. Yeah, you know, onboard computers are fast, right? If, if, if you have cameras that run at 60 frames a second, that gives you 33 milliseconds to do any sort of AI processing. Mm -hmm. And you can do a lot of processing in 33 milliseconds per yeah. frame. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so part of that is, yeah, data transfer to a centralized fusion hub. And I think Amberella here is doing some of that fusion as well. Yep. Um, so they have in the so they have basically two bits of IP that do the, the AI processing on these signals. And um, one is more like a, a an AI processor and the other one is a bit more like a generalized vector processor. And that is the one that's doing some of the radar pre-processing as it comes right. in. They have Oculi special algorithms and yeah. so on for that. And then it goes to the AI processor and, and basically combines combines and does the, the actual uh, fusion. I think mm. it's, yeah, so it's, it's very, uh, heavily optimized for this application. Yeah, I mean, Amber is a company that I hear about every so often, but they don't necessarily do you know, big media blasts and because they, they've been around a while. They've been around a while, we're doing video processing for a long yeah. time. Um, Dedicated customer yeah, base. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, so automotive, and they also do chips for like security cameras, yep. aggregation of uh, security camera feeds and so on, um, which is another big market. So yeah, 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 the, yeah, the interesting company. <laughs> and uh, all of those are experiencing an AI revolution in compute. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, no surprise to me. It shouldn't really be a surprise to us. They developed their own IP really yeah. to do this yeah. and, and really gone for it. Awesome. So that's a wrap on the penultimate uh, live after show podcast thing uh, for the AI hardware show. Uh, thank you all for watching. Stay tuned for the final one coming soon. And thanks as always to Sally. Thank you very much. See you in the next one.